Okay. No, you got to wait. It's going to, it's 10 seconds when you push the button on. Oh, okay. So how do I know when it's... Because it's counting down for you. Now yeah, it's recording it. by, because under REC, Pull we got that. that. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. so now can I Pull just turn this off. into off? Whatever. If I have to, I'm going to be wanting to look around at all your, your oh, museum. You can look around all <laughs> okay, we're just about there. And it's going. Okay. Right. And that one's going. Okay, what a pleasure it is to be here it with Lynn Sachs in October of 2008. Yeah. Thank you so much. So the first question, Lynn, is what's the best thing for a human being? Oh, gosh. Um, I would say the best thing for a human being is to have a sense of love for someone, something, some animal that sustains them. Um, may not be considered continuous but these moments of compassion and passion for something outside yourself so you have a, a reason for continuing in life. Hmm, that was good. And what is your favorite form of information? Oh, whoa, that's a big jump. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, my favorite form of information Is a uh, yeah, this is uh, this is interesting. Um, a few years ago, I was talking to a friend of mine who's very involved in the world of anthropology, and she used the word storytell. She said, "Oh, I love to he hear people storytell," and I said, "Ooh, I didn't know storytell is a verb," and she said course in anthropology and probably Margaret Mead used that and I said to myself that's what I like the best to hear people um, recount things that happen in their lives and I do not care one bit if they tell the truth and it's actually far more interesting to me when they invent right. uh, and so I never ask people to prove anything and if People, friends of mine tell me a story and then they tell it to me again and it's a little different, then I think they're being creative. Yeah. So I guess that's my favorite way to get information is directly from the source, but the source has the power to transform. Right. Uh, so that's really interesting Good. to me. And, but would it be spoken word only or would it matter if it was a letter? It could be a letter. It, it doesn't could be matter. a drawing when as, people yeah. recount their life experiences. I love that. Right. Um, and and um, and then I get to participate. It's like a film. Yeah. I mean, film and art and music—they're all amazing. But they really take—they all take the, a secondary place equally to me, to the to actually the direct human interaction. Right. <laughs> Why do you think humans collect information? Uh, I have this. Uh, this mental image that I've carried with me for a long time, probably since I read Toni Morrison's novel, The Bluest Eye. Have you ever read that book? I'm a, I'm it's a, a great piece of fiction. It's quite short. Uh, about a little girl, a little Af African-American girl who has blue eyes. So she's unusual and everybody wants to look at her. And so there's a scene in that book, which I adore, um, of a cupboard that she has and she doesn't have access to any art uh, making um, utensils, she doesn't have drawing paper, she doesn't have colored pencils. It, this is my recollection of it, but like I said, the recollection and the twisted recollection right. are as important as what it really was, but this is the way it is in my oh, yeah. memory bank. Um, so she has this cupboard and that's her artwork, uh, kind of like Louise Bourgeois, or, you know, we, I think they have a big show of her work up right yeah. now. You know, that, that you take um, elements of your, your daily life and you make that into an artistic right. practice, consciously or unconsciously. So she's always moving things around in her cupboard and she thinks about patterns and colors and how things shine. And But I also think of a cupboard like that as a place where we store our own information. So we have all these shelves and um, we have the shelves which allow us easy access to things that we need to recall all the time right. um, and we need we want to 
and we need to. Then there are the th things on that shelf that actually we'd rather forget, but they're right there and we can't forget because every time we go into our little cupboard of our consciousness, they're right there reminding you of the awful truth. So those are, and then there's these other kinds of information. You use the word information, but I also say, you know, memory or consciousness. Right. Um, there are other things that are much deeper in the um, um, cupboard of our con of our minds. Right. Um, and I like cupboard too because it's a little bit of a feminine thing and it's I, a little I bit love, homey. I love it. Yeah. Um, and uh, so though there are things that are way back there and you forgot they were there. And then when you move one thing over, there it is. And so that then it comes back to the surface. But it's all there. Right. It just depends on how you participate with it. Some people participate as artists, so they have to they're always drawing right. from their their um, repository. Or they other people have a, you know they they work with what's right there on the surface. Now, I'm not saying they're superficial or anything, but they they don't want to dig deep. Maybe they have a bad a past that hurts them. It's mm -hmm. painful. So, if they can have that control of that information, the interesting thing about being human and not being a dog is that we don't really have control of that of our consciousness. So, sometimes things come back and we're not ready for it. Mm -hmm. And we have these reminders. And so that, you know, you're always trying to think what separates us from animals. And some right. people say tools and other people might say consciousness. Right. <laughs> so do you think, uh, what was the reason why we collect information? Just Oh, the briefly. reason? Because uh, that, that was oh, I'm good. Yeah, but uh, that was good description. Oh, thank I mean, you. Sort of I think the reason that we collect information, um, let me think for a second. Um, I think the reason is because it allows us to place ourselves on this timeline, which is life. Like, if you don't have any sense of history, then you don't know where you put your feet down. So if you collect his historical elements or you th collect fragments of your culture, then you have a little bit of a sense of who you are in space. Right. Um, and so either that makes you matter or it makes you in a very daunting way insignificant mm -hmm. but you're always trying to figure out who you are in right. the world um and so that's i think that, I no guess that's, that's good why. do you think it's uh, nature and nurture that we collect information um, hardwired or did we learn oh uh, that what a great question <laughs> um <laughs> I think it's nature. Okay. I think it's the nature of it, we're hard of being. Yeah. What's your earliest memory, or could you, can you conjure up your earliest memory? Give me a few seconds. <laughs> no, all, silence earliest, is always earliest. okay. In these. It is okay. Yeah, oh, I like totally. silence too. Oh. I always, say, I think the si well, I don't know you very well, but mm -hmm. I've know I've known you for a long time in terms of and and um, I say the sign of a friendship is if you can be silent together. Yeah, I, I, even a relationship. Oh yeah. You know, so um, <clears throat> um, my earliest memory. Okay, I'll bring up. I remember riding in a little train at the zoo in Memphis, um, with probably with my dad and my sister. My brother wasn't born yet, and then another. Can I tell you another early memory? Sure. Yeah, another early memory. So I would have been. Four, so I'm sure I have earlier memories. Was um, I have a brother who's also a filmmaker? I don't know if you knew that, but um, uh, <clears throat> he makes narrative films. Oh. Um, he he was born in 1965. I was born in 61. So I remember Thanksgiving and without because he was born around Thanksgiving right. in 65. So I remember sitting around the table and feeling strange. My mother wasn't there, and um, so that's another. Cool. Is, memory. is memory a curse or a blessing? Oh, for me, it's definitely a blessing. Um, because almost all of my films deal with the playful, compulsive relationship I have to memory. Um, and um, the, uh, the way that I remember things and the um, process of remembering things and the... Um, struggle you know sometimes you 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 have to work at 
reconstructing things, and I make films about people who are trying to resurrect things right. in relationship to their memory. So I think it's it's like a great game. Yeah. Um, so. Great. Um, who were your real early, just briefly, your early role models within your family and outside your family? Oh. And just briefly, what did you specifically learn from mm -hmm. them or a major influence of them? A major influence. Um, I had a great aunt, Isabel, and in fact, I had a pen name for a long time, and my pen name was Isabel Caspian. So other than having to sign my name to maybe a test at school. I always signed Isabel Caspian. I had pencils with Isabel yeah. Caspian on it. And um, if I went to a store and had to maybe sign up for, um, you know, a, a free shopping spree, and you, if you want it, you'd run it by your name. That was Isabel Caspian, not Lynn Sachs. So it was th my Aunt Isabel um, was always a little old southern lady in my mind, but she was an avid collector of artists made books. She had probably thousands, mm. and I found out towards the end of her life that she was actually known all over the country as this little old lady in Memphis. You know, she had Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg, and um, um, she loved collaborations between poets and um, art, fine art, you know, painters and right. illustrators. Um, people who drew and um, collage artists and she knew all about them and when I was a teenager once she gave me a Kathy Acker book I mean she was very wow. hip totally like very open minded That's heavy. and um, but very private about it because none of her friends would have been interested in that and so she built shelves in her living room for her books and so whenever I would go over there she'd say let's look at the books because she believed that Anything like that, even if it was, you know, had great value, was meant to be touched and read and read right. over and over and yeah. over again. And if you were, if she, for example, had a book of um, Ulyss the Ulysses and, it, and an artist had um, um, done an interpretation of right. that, then she would have read the whole thing, even if it got her fingerprints on it. And that was, wow. she didn't look at it as a museum. It was, it was her library. And of course... I mean, my, my mom knew quite a bit about art, but she didn't know about the art world. So she just thought it was a neat thing that our Aunt Isabel had that. And Aunt Isabel um, would order these books uh, through the mail. But of course, this was way before the Internet. So she, she knew the, the print, the um, publishers who did that, the presses, the small presses. She'd be in contact with them. She would t write them letters, and then she would buy them. And um, so that was a big influence on me, even though she wasn't an artist, but she was just this marvelous Beautiful. woman who, yeah, so I would say she was and one And how of, about outside your immediate family? Any outside major? my family. Um, did you say early or just early, in general? Early or in general, however you want. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, well, lots of people. Uh, I would say probably the... One of the biggest influences was Chris Marker, um, and I love his films. Just by seeing his film, you never met him. No, I've met him quite a couple of times, and I worked on here? a film. Here or in Last France? year. In France? Well, um, I, I wrote a letter to Chris Marker in the mid-'80s when I was in graduate school after I saw Sans Soleil. And uh, I just wrote him a letter and said that I, I was in, living in San Francisco, and I really liked the film, and I actually... And, and I'd written a paper um, at San Francisco State. So he wrote me back a letter, not this was an email, of course, and he said, Oh, I'd like to see the paper. So handwritten I or handwritten with his was over. handwritten. Well, my letter was handwritten too, probably. And his was handwritten too? I think so. Wow. So he wrote me back. I think so. I hope you got that. <laughs> well, I don't remember what I wrote. Right, but, but you, you I have, have your his letter. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I hope so. Um, anyway, now that you're asking. It's got to be on some somewhere. cupboard or some yeah. shelf. I keep letters like that. Yeah. Right, one of those. That's so he wrote me back, and he and I, and he had written his response to my paper, because I wrote about Roland Barthes and mythologies. Right. And um, he kind of disagreed with me on a few things. And then he came to um, Berkeley probably a year later, and because uh, he had a relationship with P. 
people at the Pacific Film Archive, and so he went and he'd made some films there. So this was probably in about '87, and he called me up and he said, "Do you want to have coffee?" And so I went and picked him up. I was nervous wreck, and um, we had coffee at Vesuvius. Remember, oh, you know that cafe. Course, I know. So we had coffee there, talked for a really long time, and then at the end, I committed the ultimate. I said, could I take your picture? And he doesn't like to have his picture taken. And you couldn't tape record it either. No, no, you no. Never even so asked I, so he said no. And then I thought, oh, I've ruined our friendship. <laughs> I hadn't really. And then he occasionally would come through San Francisco a few years after that, and I would go hear him talk, and we'd talk a little bit. And then um, I've been to Paris maybe a few times over that long stretch of time, and we'd talked on the phone. And then last year. Um, uh, a man from First Run Icarus, a distribution company right. in New York, who they distribute a couple of my films and Chris, all of Chris Marker's in the States. He called me and he said, or wrote me a letter actually, he said, we have a, fil a short film that Chris Marker made uh, in the 70s about whales. It's a essay, one of his whack what? experimental essay films using all found footage. Act. Mo right. no, mostly, it's mostly found. And a few, few right. sections about whales. I mean, of whales. But he wants to do a new, a new English because it's only in French, a new English uh, soundtrack. Right. So would you do that for him? So I said sure. And it was a lot of work because we had to translate it into right. from French to English. Then we we had to update right. it because it was, and then I had to find people to do the voices. Right. But it meant that for about six months, almost every day, we were exchanging emails about the text and about every little thing. Um, and so then last summer, 2007, um, I was with my girls. Mark was not there because he had to go to Marseille, but we went to Paris and we spent the day with him oh and my God. hung out with him. With he, his house is very similar to this. Wow! And he has, but he has all these televisions. He's always downloading things from Russian television, and wow. and we looked at all his cats. Okay, well you you're I'm doing a new workshop. It's called How Chris Marker Fucked Me Up. <laughs> That's because oh. Oren from uh, Ann Arbor said, that film, San Soleil, fucked my shit up. Anyways, we could go on for we'll Chris about, for yeah. hours. But I'll just but talk I, about I, and I'd that, like you to see the But what would you film. say within a sentence? Mm -hmm. What have you, what has Chris influenced you or... Can you say it really yeah, concise? Yeah, I'll try to Just be concise. Say, yeah. Okay, sorry that story went No, on that's all, you believe me, it's all good. Okay, Yeah. Um, I would say that what thrills me most about his work is that everything has a relationship to everything else. And that's, <laughs> that's the kind of good. films I make, too. Um, I always say there's some films you, you make and you say these are no films, which is okay, which means it's, a, it's about right. something and right. then there's many things it's not about. Right. Then I have other films where... Um, it's about anything and anything that relates to anything that relates to anything else, and all those right. connections are very compelling, and, and that's like a yes film. Yeah. And so I think he guided me to the yes films. So. That's beautiful. Thank you for being decisive. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> we're going to go into Ann Arbor Film Festival, okay. Little World, um, and uh, start off. Actually, before we will, try these two. So... Um, James Joyce was the first projectionist in Dublin. He says, why should I... Then he says, I'm out of here because why should I go inside a building and look at a movie of a tree when I can go outside and see a real tree? Mm -hmm. So, and then Faulkner goes, well, the best fiction, sometimes more true than journalism. Why do humans need to recreate, use metaphor? Uh, use metaphor? Can yeah. I say one other thing that sure. would go in that trajectory sure. of the three things? Sure. John Cage said, why... Would we want to interpret Beethoven over and over and over and over again when I can sit in my apartment and open the window and listen to Sixth Avenue? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But when he says interpret, does he mean why do we need to listen to Beethoven? Or play it because he oh, was a oh, musician. Listen, listen or, or, or play. Or, yeah, but why he meant we, play. He did not, it, oh, you mean he meant play the song. Why yeah. should we play Beethoven, Beethoven. That's what over, I meant to say. Yeah, okay. No, that's fine. Play. Okay. Because he was <laughs> we talking about... We should listen to street noise. Yeah, play. Well, or play or... I mean, he was... I suppose he was thinking about both composing. Yeah. I say interpret because I was thinking about, let's say you had a pianist. Right. And, and he was trying to to um, right. 
to perform right. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony right. and get it exactly right. right. That for Cage was dull. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, so So then, but why 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 what does this have to do with Cage? I understand yeah, that. that's yeah, beautiful cuz yeah. I the, all my stuff around wounds around Cage main oh, it majorly. Does. Oh yeah. Oh, but why yeah. why do we need metaphor? Yeah, basically why do we need to recreate? You know, I mean, why do you, you know, I don't want to go specifically yeah. into your film, but, you know, why do you have to tell people about Cannonsville 9 when we could just go out and do a new Cannonsville 9? Or, or you know, yeah, why yeah, yeah, Why do you, either, either even in, in, in a metaphoric way, or mm-hmm. why do humans have to recreate anything? Mm-hmm. Why can't we just sit under a tree, mm-hmm. let the apples fall, you chew on them, and you look at the clouds, and the clouds move around, and there's your art form and your TV right. and your movie. Um, but why do we... Well, you know, it's inter- you say, why do we have to? Right. And, um, and yeah. it's interesting, because um, I think that, that the act of... Again, I use the word inter- um, interpreting reality... And then twisting that reality, which is to make metaphor, is um, uh, or comes out of some of the same impulses that religion does, in that it gives us a sense of spiritual connection to the yeah. world around us um, that many people, at least in our society, find through religion, yeah. and uh, that gives them a reason for being and a reason for thinking. So um, I think that art satisfies some of those same desires and, and um, fears of emptiness. Right. Like that expression, har vacai. Do you know that? Don't know it. Har vacai is Latin, but it means um, a fear of emptiness. So uh, we and, well, How do you spell it real quick? H-O-R-R-O-R. Uh-huh. Horror and vacai means vac- like vacuum. V-A-C-U. B A C U A E. Okay, like, okay, got like fear, va- fear of uh, emptiness. Emptiness. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I think we all have that, uh, e- e- whether it's in our domestic environment or it's in our own um, minds. Right. Uh, and so the, the metaphor allows us to fill it in our own very personal, with your fingerprint way. Like a metaphor makes you different from me. (laughs) Um, Even though we both see the same tree, but you relate it to something else and create some, and I, and that makes it yours. Yeah, very good. (laughs) Now, Lewis Hine shot photographs of child labor and printed in the newspapers and changed laws. It was the tipping point. Mm -hmm. Upton Sinclair wrote a novel the jungle change laws, meatpacking laws in Chicago mm-hmm. with the novel. Leonard Cohen says, I want a poem that rages and changes laws. Has any film, art, theater ever changed a law? This mm. is the tipping point. I'm not after we shall overcome or music. There's yeah, four of them. Has and we're not after law? what we shall overcome. I'm all for it. It was part of the zeitgeist, but it didn't change the law. And I'm being okay. particular, and I'm not saying that's not good. I'm all for where we Can I say go. change the law in a bad way, too? Of course. Okay. It's just a, if, has any I of actually, those four yes. things actually changed the law? I, th- yeah. I can think of a work of art that changed the law um, to the detriment of society, unfortunately. Um, and this is a work of art I love, but the response of the government to this work of art was to change laws. Uh, and that was um, Marlon Riggs' uh, Tongues Untied. Did you oh, ever see that? Oh, I know about it, but I haven't seen it. So, Tongues Untied. Yeah. Um, Marlon Riggs, just for the so record, how, you how, probably know yeah. about... Do you know about Marlon Riggs? I don't Riggs? know a lot, but let's not go too far into it. Just Why don't we leave that for the person to explore, but tell me what, just what, what did it change. Okay. Yeah, what briefly. happened was Jesse Helms saw R- Tongues Untied, which is, was a very yeah. explicitly... Um, uh, gay right. film and African American film, and um, and it had been supported by the National Endowment for the Arts. And when Jesse Helms saw that, right, ten or fifteen years more than that ago, yeah. he said, "Oh no, we cannot have art 
that ha- that has a government stamp of approval <laughs> that is about right. homosexual relationships. Right. No way. And so he changed this. The, Did the, he? Yes. That's and amazing. And it was that film. Now, I congratulate you because very few people get this question, and they they they're all, they don't understand the question, and you got it. And, and the other good answer I got was. Ralph Nader's press conferences as performance art. They oh. change laws. Oh, interesting. So it is possible, but it's it's strange, in essence, that pe- it, we tend to think that theater, film, music, and art are as powerful as the printed medium, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. they are. But it's so rare that people can come answer this question. They go, they're really confident. And and I'm not trying, it's not a trick question. I'm all for all those, and they all have, that we can't deny they're very important. So, Oh, thank, good, I'm glad that was helpful. That. that was good. Because Marlon Riggs is a really important part. Can oh, I just say one thing sure, about him? Sure, sure. Um, I, I met him in the 80s, and he had done traditional documentaries, and then he by chance went to the Flaherty Film Seminar and discovered experimental film. Wow. Um, and he, from then on, he wanted to make experimental films, and he did it in a way that was very um, influential, very passionate, very um, right. much extension of everything that he was. He came from Harvard, you know, he's a very well-educated guy. Wow. And then, you know, then he died of AIDS. Wow. Mm-hmm. So got, it was yeah. a short, short career. But, but um, he, on he, fire career. Wow, yeah. on fire, beautiful. Okay, so say we're sitting. <laughs> let's let's do this one. Okay, so at the Ann Arbor Film Festival a couple years ago, I'm talking to a screenwriting teacher, and he says a good film is when you can clearly see the intention of the filmmaker. So I started asking people about that, and one person says. Stanley Kubrick says the opposite. He says a good film is when you can't see the intention yeah. of the filmmaker. Could you comment on intention and agenda and motive just briefly in your uh-huh. filmmaking process? Oh, um, and you can observe uh, the, the comment itself in general, either, however you want to approach um, the, the idea. Um, for me, uh, a good film is a film that um, begins with a, 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 to- a moment, and the moment could be extended as long as it happens to be, of confusion, so that the person who's watching the film, the audience member, all realizes quite quickly that that person has to participate very actively in order to learn the language of the film. And I think every film, not every filmmaker, but every film has to have its own language. That's what makes it experimental to me. Even if an experiment, even if you're talking about a, a narrative film that's shown in the big theaters, and it still has to invent within the form its own language, and and the language becomes kind of a glossary or a lexicon by which the the viewer can start to grapple with the what you were calling intentions like the intentions are not clear at the start but you realize that the that the artist behind the film either had an intention maybe of articulating some message which is somewhat interesting or what's more interesting to me is that the film makes you think about yourself and who you are in society or th- thinks about other people outside yourself, which is always important. You have to remember that um, in a new way. It makes you ask questions of the world. Even yeah. though I make films that sometimes fall under that rubric of documentary, like they play right. with reality, right. uh, I'm not trying to inform, but I'm trying to spark a new way of questioning. Right. So that's probably, a, a, in a broad way, my um, intention. Right. No, that's good. And in, in would you new way of questioning? Boy, that's great. well put. Um, and just off the top of your head, would you say a good film is when you can clearly see the intention, or not clearly see? Just um, it's too complex to answer, or w- can you take a side there? Usually, I l- okay, I'll talk about likes and dislikes rather than. Yeah, right, 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 right. Well, usually, I enjoy. Um, 
there's a I, I'm just learning Spanish. Do you yeah. know Spanish? I don't know it. Oh, there's like there's one word that I really like in Spanish that we don't have one quite like it. I think it's pronounced disfrutar, which is like comes from fruit almost, to, which means to entertain. So you could say like, what what, what you know what yeah. entertain what right. makes you feel nourished right. through entertainment? Because we are in the entertainment right. world, right? <laughs> <laughs> the business. We're in the entertainment business. That is Which great. is funny to say in Hollywood. That is good. That's yeah. really beautiful that you can say that. <laughs> um, you said that your whole career? No, I just said it now because oh, I'm in Hollywood. That is just go oh, because you're, oh, it, it's Well, uh, because energy. yesterday, right. I'm going to say it. Okay. Like, yesterday <laughs> I was um, talking to someone about a, a school here in Los right. Angeles, and she said, oh, most of the people who teach who, most of the parents there are in the entertainment, entertainment business. business. <laughs> so I, I sort of thought, maybe I'm in the entertainment Inter business, business too. too. <laughs> wow. Lynn, that is so good. It is here, so poo-pooed when people come to L.A. I know, because it is it's like an insult. You guys, oh, you guys are plastic surgery phonies. And, and like, you're in the entertainment business, yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, we yeah, all well for you to be an experimental filmmaker and come to our town and say, I'm in the entertainment business, I salute you. Thank you. you know. Well, it's always used as an insult, right? You know, it's I mean, always, we say it, it in, in a condescending in, way. And one of my mentors, Frank Zappa, was entertainment all the way. And he's like the most biting guy, guy yeah. sparking new questions. And he would just, so it's almost like a guy. But anyways, uh, go ahead. So that was a great diversion. But oh, you, yeah, okay. <laughs> Wait, can you... Yeah, we were... Basically, you were uh, saying... Uh, if if you, you... You were saying a Spanish word. Oh, just that, about yeah, entertain... That, to, yeah. to, to, ple to give right. pleasure to yourself. Right. Um, but... Um, wait, what, what, what was your... So, big, but the, the, the head of it was whether um, you could, uh, just off the top of your head, say, if it's... You... you like a film more when you can clearly see oh, the intention. Oh, I probably like it when I can't clearly. Can't see it. Okay, that's fine. That's okay. just my my no, pleasure no, that, yeah. my pleasure zone. Yeah, no, because it's interesting. You don't think of Ann Arbor as being a screenwriting school. You think of it as the roots of great experimental film. Now they're teaching screenwriting. Then the oh, screenwriter are? teacher, yeah. and it's a big program, and the screenwriting teacher tells me that. Yeah. And I'm like, that was good because it spurred all this other thinking. So... Anyway, I so, hope you're going to give me a chance to tell you one Ann Arbor anecdote. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, we're going to get to it because okay, I have so a really good one. <laughs> intention. Okay, now, uh, uh, this is a little off skew, but you said it it's so well. McLuhan said there's no such thing as a good or a bad film, it's a good or a bad viewing experience. Oh, yeah. So, just briefly, can you comment on that? Um, or should I put it no, in context? No, I like the idea of, 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 uh, of seeing the viewing experience as the gestalt of a work of art in right. a, and even a film is it yeah. so that we can look at film as a um, three and four dimensional experience yeah so th the third dimension which is the spatial dimension is m very often not concerned I think that's a that's a, where we those of us who are keen on still per preserving film and community so that film's not just seen in a private space, but yeah. that you see it and you hear. I think it's yeah. so important to hear other people breathing. Yeah. I think it's so important to hear laughter. Good. I think it's like yeah. vital to hear restlessness and yawns right. and all those things. So you can have a point of distinction. You know, I see things one way and other people see it the other. You know, this was so tedious to hundreds of people. They all left, but I stayed because I... Wanted right. to see Chantelle Ackerman's Jean Dielman. I knew there'd be a payoff. <laughs> and and, and you was know that there? Was, yeah, it's a three-hour film. Right. That's, you know, and Good, so a, there was a payoff for you. There is a you. payoff, yeah. yes. There is a payoff, and um, worth it. Worth it. <laughs> I love that expression, worth it. Um, worth it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I think that the, that the whole... Yeah, no, that was good, and you brought up the salt. Okay, we're getting into Ann Arbor slowly but surely, but first, and we both know... Great reputation for over four decades, mm -hmm. nourishing experimental film. Greenaway said, cinema um, is much too rich a medium to be left to storytellers. Go to back to your storytell verb. Yeah. I seem to be a verb myself. I seem to be... Okay, so he says it's much too rich to be left to storytellers. 
Are experimental filmmakers telling a story a different way, or are they doing something completely different? Well, I actually think they, that experimental filmmakers are storytelling, but they're just re, re defining the word storytell because a film does pass through time and it does rely on uh, um, an exploration of of a figure moving through through space uh, I guess it's storytelling. I don't know. Now maybe I'll contradict okay, that. Okay, now can okay. You maybe to just it? no. Just the the usually what I say is um, so is Tony Conrad's Flickr yeah. storytelling. We 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 know already that I, we can both watch Flickr and have a story in our head. Yeah. Um, but that that that's why I, I sort of pose a question. I, I'm constantly really struggling yeah. with the question. Because I put it in simple terms, because I say, are they telling stories in a different way? Which is evident. We all know that. Or are they doing something completely different? And then people go, well, Bo. But I, you right. know, I'm maybe trying I'll to say, get... Maybe I'm going to disagree with myself and say, <laughs> some, some, fil- it, okay, um, people overuse the word abstract, I believe. They think anything that is not storytelling is abstract. That's ridiculous. <laughs> to be abstract is to be completely non-referential and to move away from from um, semiotics, to to move away from any kind of sign and signifier relationship, um, which is usually how stories work. So if you're talking about Flickr film, it's so outside. Um, the our points of reference that maybe it isn't storytelling. Although one of the first Flickr films, Arnold Rainer, uh, by Kubelka, Peter Kubelka, uh, pre pre Tony Tony Conrad. It's from um, I think sixty two or so. Yeah, same period. But, yeah, but you don't know. It's, if it's all black before uh, Tony or not. No, yeah. I'm so not it's sure. the same period. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What? Um, he was Peter Kubelka, Austrian filmmaker, was. Um, commissioned to make a film about a performance artist named Arnold Rainer, and he just made a black and white flicker film. Ah, and, and, Arnold, and it's a very famous film. Right? right, and he's not even in it. No, the guy's he's not, not in it at all. <laughs> but it's far more famous than a straight documentary portrait. And all his black and white footage. Yes, <laughs> but so you could say it's a story because it you're watching it and you have to you are inventing who is Arnold Rainer because you know the title. You know the title, but but if you just walk in and, and yeah. you can, then it's, the title, you don't know the title refers to a performance right. artist. And people who aren't who are sort of um, disdainful no, I, of Flickr films would probably call it wallpaper. Right. Well, yeah. I've I've read that title for years, and I I never knew it was about a performance artist. So yes, yeah, there was you know, a real yeah, person. Yeah, no, I believe you, but I'm just saying. So back, so <laughs> just back to it. Yeah, is. Is Flickr storytelling? Is basically is either of those is Kabelka or Conrad storytelling? Um, you know, without knowing, it's about the performance artist. I'd have to say no. It's not. Yeah. It's not storytelling. Okay. But it references storytelling, right. and it's very interesting because I think that um, the 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 burden of experimental film is that we. Um, are always defining ourselves by what we're not. Uh, <laughs> explain that one. The burden of experimental film yeah. is that we're what? Referencing ourselves by what we are not. We're explaining oh, ourselves. Oh, we're referencing by what we are not. Yeah. Okay. Because we're saying we're not just making films. We're making experimental films because we have to separate ourselves from something called film, which is maybe mostly the movies that are seen. The, in, I mean, if you're talking about the larger culture. Right. Um, so, uh, actually, I brought you this essay I'm going to give to you. Good. Um, but part of it is, you know, oh, I'm an atheist. I wrote something about you. Oh, an atheist. So you have to define yourself by the fact that you don't believe in God. 
Instead of just saying right. who you are. Right, right, right. Were you raised a particular religion? Jewish. Okay. And um, I was going to shoot that one. And we're going to do this good with Mark so we can get him right, <laughs> right in the same order. Because, okay, see, perfect. that's where some of the questions, when you refer something, then I shoot a question. Oh, that's that just going to be so, fun. So, you know, so, but I'm going to try to do it. So that was good. We pretty much, you, if you, unless you have anything else to say about the green and white, you know, Not right now. Cin cinema yeah. is sure it should be about this. Okay, so now me and you are sitting around and we're starting the Ann Arbor Film Festival with George Manupelli. But before we do that, yeah. we're going to hear Chick Strand say how she started with Bruce Canyon Cinema Screenings. And they said, we want to, this she told me, I want to, we want to recreate our 11 cent movie going experience where we show a serial a cartoon and a feature and then an experimental film yeah so then brackage came in and said that's all wrong you don't want to show all that stuff it already has a place to show yeah. just show experimental film so knowing that mm -hmm. we're starting ann arbor film festival do we want to be inclusive or exclusive oh definitely exclusive definitely, definitely exclusive. exclusive so you've got your why do we want to be exclusive? Because there are plenty of places to see everything else. So exclusively experimental film is good. Um, and then you redefine experimental film in all different kinds of ways. So that's what I mean by, I'm, I'm usually a very inclusive person, <laughs> but every once I, in a while, you have to set good, your limits. You're good, Lynn. I like you. All right. you got to set your limits. Well, to me, now that's... You know, in you, I don't know how much you know how the festival's changed specifically over the last three years, and how. Yes, I think that um, the 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 burden of experimental film is that we um, are always defining ourselves by what we're not. Uh, <laughs> explain that one. The burden of experimental film. Yeah. Is that we're what? Referencing ourselves by what we are not. We're explaining oh, ourselves. Oh, we're referencing by what we are not. Yeah. Okay. Because we're saying, we're not just making films, we're making experimental films. Because we have to separate ourselves from something called film, which is maybe mostly the movies that are seen. The, I mean, if you're talking about the larger culture. Right. Um, so... Uh, actually, I brought you this essay I'm going to give to you. Good. Um, but part of it is, you know, oh, I'm an atheist. I wrote something about, you know, oh, an atheist. So you have to define yourself by the fact that you don't believe in God. Instead of just saying right. who you are. Right, right, right. Were you raised a particular religion? Jewish. Okay. And um, i got to shoot that one. And we're going to do this good with Mark so we can get him right. <laughs> right in the same order. Because okay, see, perfect. that's where some of the questions, when you refer something, then I shoot a question. Oh, that's that just going to be so, fun. You know, so, but I'm going to try to do it. So that was good. We pretty much, you, if you, unless you have anything else to say about the green and white, you know, right c now. cinema is yeah. sure it should be left to. Okay, so now me and you are sitting around and we're starting the Ann Arbor Film Festival with George Manupelli. But before we do that, yeah. we're going to hear Chick Strand say how she started with Bruce Canyon Cinema Screenings and they said we want to, this she told me, I want to, we want to recreate our 11 cent movie going experience where we show a serial, a cartoon and a feature and then an experimental film. Yeah. So then Brackage came in and said that's all wrong. You don't want to show all that stuff. It already has a place to show. Yeah. Just show experimental film. So knowing that, mm -hmm. We're starting Ann Arbor Film Festival. Do we want to be inclusive or exclusive? Oh, definitely exclusive. Definitely, definitely exclusive. exclusive. So you've got your, why do we want to be exclusive? Because there are plenty of places to see everything else. So exclusively experimental film is good. Um, and then you redefine experimental film in all different kinds of ways. So that's what I mean by, I'm, I'm usually a very inclusive person, but every <laughs> once in a while, you have You're to set good, your limits. You're good, Lynn. I like limits. you. All right. you got to set your limits. Well, to me, now that's, you know, in, I don't know how much you know how the festival's changed specifically over the last three years, and how once we started seeing this change, and we're seeing stuff like Brian Konefsky says, 
That's a Nike commercial. Are they and showing the, things like that now? Well, and then the next guy says, you know, Dan Gunning says, I didn't fly 3,000 miles to see something I could watch on TV. But look at, I don't know if they, we weren't, I mean, when did you attend? Um, Over I think the years, I've been twice. Oh, in um, the 70s or 80s no, 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 or 90s? No, no, 90s. Okay, um, so we don't know in the 60s, 70s, or 80s if people were saying the same thing. Like, hey, you're selling out. You're selling, showing stuff that's not so experimental. Both times I was there, um, the, oh gosh, the woman who also did hair was the... Um, she, Le, uh, 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 what's her name? We both know what we're talking yes. about. Because she yeah. had a beauty parlor. Yeah, yeah, no, we, no, I know her, I know her. Yeah, yeah but. Um, so I went, I think I went once to the Ann Arbor Film Festival as a filmmaker, and, and, then, you, and then I went once as a judge. Judge, okay. Yeah. Okay, now, let's go back to film festival, but here's the big problem I have with Definitely the, in the 90s. Yeah, de in the 90s. So, we can get back to what we Maybe were just talking in, about a little. Actually, I think it, I went in early 2000 also. Okay. So, so, so I don't know. So, exactly. so we're, we'll get back to that in general, uh -huh. that inclusive excellence. But um, what you have happening is um, do only rich kids who get to go to art school know about experimental film. In the 50s, mm -hmm. The general public in America saw, to your, use your word, well put, well brought up, abstract art on the cover of Life magazine. Mm -hmm. They saw Jackson Pollock. They didn't see Maya Darren or Bruce Conner. We've never been able, basically, as a complete country, to establish, an, a, to form an aesthetic on experimental film and it's only rich kids. Until two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Something happened two years ago, and I can see it. Okay. Uh, I, I teach, uh, I only teach one But you would here. agree before the two years yes. that it's a sad thing in a way. Mm. So isn't that, back, just now go into that, but keep in mind, isn't that, why should we go exclusive when we should have gone from the beginning inclusive? Not saying I'm not saying we should yeah. have, because I agree with you that the Ann Arbor Film Festival has done its agenda. But if, as the old school people come in and see stuff that tends to be more commercial or more yeah. Hollywood or whatever, do we complain or do we rejoice that it's becoming more inclusive because that's the way? Shouldn't it be I can watch The Simpsons, then Bruce Conner? Oh, uh, you know, I would shouldn't your complain. kids? Yeah. Yeah, okay. But what's, so. what's been happening in, um, to me in the last two years is um, that uh, people who participate in the internet, so it's mostly young people, are seeing really outlandish, crass, campy, sometimes abstract films, and they're seeing them on the internet, and they're seeing them for free. And that's what they, they and they're seeing them like on YouTube and, and or Ubu. Do you know about Oh, yeah, Ubu? I know. Yeah. You know, and they're like, when I talk about George Kuchar now, and, and some, or they see some, and I mention it to students. Siamese twins. Yeah, they, they go, <laughs> they find go out, watch. They go find out everything they can about George Kuchar. Yeah. Or we, you know, we talk about, ex how do you define experimental film? Let's go see what Fred Camper says about Right. Experimental film right. out of Chicago. And they're like way more sophisticated than even than than eighteen to twenty five year olds a few years ago because anything they want to know that's we used to consider obscure and only available to the elite is not elite anymore. It can't be elite if because they it's have a computer. Yeah, if they have a computer, but they can go to the library. I mean that's, you can't see YouTube at the library. Can you can you? see it, but I, I just, I tend not to love that argument. I love it because I use the internet at the library, yeah. and I love libraries, but it's still, what you know, you're, you're talking about kids in the inner city or something? Or where do you teach? Are I've they, taught at Hunter College, uh, which is a, a public university, right. and but right now I am teaching in a more, call it elite, because right. I'm at NYU. Right. But I just teach one class a month. Right. But I get all the unhappy students at NYU. I have the most miserable students who, <laughs> who probably should leave NYU and they don't know why they ended up there. Be yeah. Because it's, yeah. you know, mostly it's teaching Rich them. kids. 
or it's, uh, that's hard for me to tell because yeah. I think they give quite a lot of scholarships, yeah. but um, boing. but it's not and and, and, and but believe right. me, I'm not trying to say even though I come off saying the word rich kids, I don't want to be scolding like you're bad if you're a rich kid. I yeah. all the power to them. I'm just saying, you see what I'm 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 getting at is that. You know, is it our job to be exclusive so we can teach more people about experimental film? And then we become exclusive. And isn't it indeed what we want is, don't we want it to be? I want it to be inclusive. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you, if you're talking about um, demography, you know, peoples, yes. If you're talking about aesthetics at the Ann Arbor, I just want them to try to... <laughs> to you know, I don't to be mean true it to has, their roots? No, it doesn't have to be abstract film, right. but personal film. Right. That's what the difference. But, yeah. you know, Mark and I are going to Echo Park Film Center. I've never been there before. Yeah. But um, I'm pretty sure it's a very grassroots place, oh, and we're teaching a workshop yeah. today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that we're passing on the faith right. <laughs> uh, to the people right. <laughs> um, today. Yeah. No, that's beautiful. And that's, that's that, that, that Paolo and... Lisa are definitely troopers in that sensibility. And they'll even say, we don't show Hollywood stuff, you know. And But then, again, I, I don't either, but then we're scolding that and we're becoming elitist backwards, uh -huh. you know, by saying that. We don't show Hollywood stuff. And I had a really astute person come up in my P. Adam Sidney interview and say, dude, don't be... You know, come on, lighten up on that. You don't think, you know, you're so high and mighty experimental film. And it wasn't, I was that, right. but she, it was a great observation. And I, believe me, I know there's venues. And, and uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> in the long run, the Ann Arbor Film Festival did something that was contrary to the whole business of cinema in America, where the studios made their films and put them into their own theaters. So they had a monopoly. Mm -hmm. And then the government says, you can't do that. Well, do you know what my take on the Ann Arbor Film Festival is? Is that it's your friends giving your friends money. Hmm. And it's a peer group. It's a group. And that's what it should be. Because we're like, okay, here's $200. Now award it to some of the... The, you know, your friends. Your friends and, and are yeah. you supposed to, like, oh, I can't give money to them. They're my friends. The The group is so small. It's not a big community. The experimental film group is, community is pretty... Do you go to Ann Arbor every year? Is that... I've um, gone lots, but not... I would I'm, add my father. This is total coincidence, because yeah. my dad doesn't have any interest, really, in experimental film, so his daughter's involved. Has a good friend who's been involved for years from Ann Arbor named Denny. Denny, I don't remember his last name, but anyway, he's just a, like a kind of a lefty lawyer who lives in Ann Arbor and goes to all the films. Well, we'll I have to get in Denny contact. Hayes. That's his name. Denny Hayes. Well, we'll have to get. I think him. he yeah. makes like a donation yeah. to the festival every year. Yeah. No, I'd love to talk yeah. to him because it, it is. He's a community person because they're always yeah. keen on. Yeah. On um, getting the community involved. Yeah. Oh no! It it you know it's a it's a beautiful thing and it, and the change is hard and last year. Someone said it so well. He says, what did you think of the festival this year? He goes, maddeningly problematic. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it was like, believe me. And I've interviewed George Manupelli about this. And it, believe me, McLuhan said it well. A half a truth is still a lot of a truth. And just to get a venue and to celebrate experimental film for a week is a great thing. So they thing. are still showing a lot of experimental film. Well, yeah, but, you know, I mean, you, you, you know, I don't want to, uh, you might go and feel completely different. Right, right. Just some of the hardcore moldy oldies are like, the heck, you know, anyways. Yeah. It's not, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I just like the whole idea of questioning it. Too okay. much me putting my point of view in whether we want right. it to be exclusive or right. inclusive, right. you know. Because right. in the long run, you know, your kids have been raised seeing some other kind of films. Yeah. But were they raised watching The Simpsons too? A little bit. Yeah. 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 And you yeah. didn't go, never watch right, that. Because right, right. you knew they wouldn't be normal then. <laughs> you know, you... Yeah. You know? And then they're going to come home and go, My Mom. daughter had her dream come true last night. <laughs> she got to see High School Musical 3. <laughs> Did you see it? 
No, she oh. we were here. But she went with a bunch oh, of her oh, friends. Oh, she she didn't come on the trip with No, you. no, she went to the premiere of High School Musical 3 yesterday. Oh, here? In New York. Oh, in New York. Yeah. And what's uh, what's your age of the... You 13 and 11. Oh, 13 and 11. Okay, so let's stay on uh, okay. Ann Arbor a little more and just... Sure. Uh, um, Are we okay? That's still be The red light's still beeping. Oh, so. yeah, this should be changed at, uh, in eight minutes. Okay. So, yeah, we're doing fine. Um... Let's do this. I'm going to ask you four questions, okay. and it's just off the top of your head. Um, what does the Ann Arbor Film Festival enhance or intensify? Hmm. I think over the years, the Ann Arbor Film Festival has supported the expression of a personal viewpoint on through the cinematic medium across the United States and abroad. I guess oh, yeah. they get a oh, lot. Yeah, yeah and, across, and it has created this very vital community in which people can come together and see one another's work and then come again and see how that artist has grown. And there's a sense of continuity that's really just fantastic. What does the Ann Arbor Film Festival render obsolete? What did it replace? Ooh. I would actually say it uh, made the. Uh, this is a little bit of a twist, but probably to my mind, the Ann Arbor Film Festival is what every small town or big city should have, which is a venue that is a continuous venue for experimental film. Um, so I don't, I'm not saying it replaced it. To me, it's a model for that. Um, and not every town, for example, Memphis has occasionally had small book stores or right. little cafes for seeing alternative media. Right. But it has it, you know, let's say from 1988 to 1998, that doesn't exist anymore. Right. But the neat thing about the Ann Arbor Film Festival is it continues and it and it it, it it makes it very legitimate by having that big is it called the State Theater? Yeah, the lo longevity. The longevity. The Michigan Theater. The Michigan the Theater. The longevity establishes its legitimacy. Yeah. yeah. But it's basically us coming, hundred people from all over, and then trying to lure a hundred other college kids in to drink beer and go ha ha look at the squiggly lines that's why i want to have a book so they go this play this is really legit it's not it is just not jokey squiggly lines now can i lines. tell my story my good anecdote please, about the ann arbor film festival please. okay cuz it, it's how that festival brings in people from that community and abroad right. um um and beyond let's right. say uh the year that I judged the Vicky Anna, Honeyman. That's her name. Thank you. <laughs> what a great name. <laughs> Woo. Um, so I've been. I was there several times by the invitation of Vicky, or I paid for right. myself to go when right. I showed my film and something right. like that. Um, so one year I judged it, and um, I loved the festival because um, <laughs> they're so driven and disciplined about everything and compulsive. So if you're a judge, you have to sit in the theater the whole time. And I've, I watch a lot of experimental films, so occasionally a film would come up I'd seen before. So I'd think, oh, this is the time I could go to the lobby, right. maybe get some popcorn, right. stretch, or go to the bathroom. Right. And they had these um, guards who were supposed to watch the judges. Oh, my yes. God. And so if you went if out, you were sleeping they'd night say, jump. you know, RK, you can run to the bathroom, <laughs> Lynn, but if you stay longer, we're going to have to stop the films. Oh, you have my to see everything, God. This every, is everything. So that meant, like, that was a Vicky thing, which it was great. You know, you can handle it, but it would be hard. You'd want to stretch <laughs> and move around and didn't know what to do, and you'd seen the film before, whatever. So um, one time, and to I was, I got, I snuck out to go, to the bed for a few minutes and it was so dark and this person a figure um i could tell it was a man that's all i knew came up to me in the dark and whispered he said hi Lynn, but i couldn't see his face so um 
I had no idea who it was. And he said, here, I want to give you this. And um, so, and, and I didn't know what it was till I went out to the lobby and then he kind of disappeared and he went back into the audience. And I realized that I looked when I got out to the lobby, he'd given me his coupon card for getting a free cup of coffee in one of those great right. cafes. He'd got, he'd drunk nine cups of coffee and the tenth was free. And so he was giving me his free cup of coffee. But I still didn't know who it was. Right. The gay. So then when the lights came up, he came up to me and he said, well, I was a student of yours at Berkeley um, a few years back. Um, I taught an avant-garde film class at Berkeley, which had a lot of students in it, probably 50 or so. So I didn't know everybody that well. And he said, now I'm a PhD student here in physics. And um, I immediately recognized him. And for a couple of reasons. One is he gave me um, a, a cassette, audio cassette, with a song that was some that the band he loved had dedicated to Stan Brakhage. He said, "You introduced me to Stan Brakhage. I would have had no idea who he was. I'm not an artist anymore. You know, I never was. This was a what? I was always a science student, but I have a love for Stan Brakhage. Um, and then I remembered another. He said, "I remembered something he this guy had done." Um, in my class with some other men and he said that that experience kind of changed my life it was a big viewing lecture class but I said one of the days in the class they had to make a video so they each went to a different room in this very large building at Berkeley and he he was a Chinese and I walked into the room where his group was making a videotape and they were making a videotape about a nudist colony so I walk into the room and the whole the room is filled with naked 20 year old men and they were making their to them making an experimental film meant that they all had to take their clothes off and I remember that and so for him he we talked about it he said that was one of the wildest experiences I've ever had in my life and it was because I took an experimental film class and then he got into Brackage and he was at the Ann Arbor Film Festival even though he was supposed to be studying physics as a PhD you know so oh, that was hey. what happened so what's, it was really cool what's his name his or last his band name, was, name do you know? The band, it wasn't his band, but it was oh. some band he liked. Right. Um, uh, like half Japanese right. or one of those kind right. of things. That, and you, and do you remember his name? His name, last name was Wong. <laughs> but I don't uh, remember his W-O-N-G. The student. W-O-N-G, right. Yeah, okay. Wong. I don't great. remember his first name. No, that but was But it was great. just that he, yeah. that, that avant-garde film right. had had filled some, some special right. place in his being. Right. That was beautiful. The third question of the four is, what does the Ann Arbor Film Festival retrieve that we previously got rid of? Oh, um, I think the Ann Arbor Film Festival celebrates non-commercial cinema so that anybody um, can, can still look at the medium of cinema, like um, going back to Milliez and, and um, Lumiere. They all both made a little money on it. But this idea that it was a continuation of the fine arts, that cinema was like that, and that it's okay to have an art that isn't going to pay your bills, but it is going to pay it is going to pay for something else, which is the delight of creativity. Right. And it really celebrates that. And it, unfortunately, most people think of movie making as money making, right. or or then it's a failure. Right. That's a, a big thing. Is is all the experimental filmmakers have to teach? Yeah. <laughs> and and Bill Brown, do you know him? Yeah, I know his films. Yeah, well, you know, I talked to him last year about it, and it's like, you know, wouldn't it be great if I could just make my films in a way? But and, I like teaching. Right, too. right. No, it's and, a nice and, thing, and yeah. believe me, I'm not saying that's not good. Yeah. That's great, but it's sort of like, you, you, you want to be a poet or a filmmaker. You got to be a teacher, yeah. well, or you got to have, you know, Charles Ives. You got to have your insurance company on the right. side, so you got money because yeah. then you'd be creative. But, but you know, there's that expression which I hate, which is "those who can't do teach." <laughs> <laughs> right? No, I, I, I don't agree with that. But I think the last question of the for the Tetrad is: if you take the Ann Arbor Film Festival and push it to an extreme, what could it flip into? Oh, cool. Um, that, that, it could become, it could definitely become, um, a film camp. 
Uh, I think that would be really exciting. You know, if they had Ann Arbor Film Festival in the summer, yeah. and, and they used the facilities at the University of Michigan, and sort of like the Flaherty. Yeah. The, it could become the Flaherty for only experimental film, though. Wouldn't Beautiful. that be neat? That would be great. And the, the cool thing is we, re we don't remember that really a percentage of Ann Arbor has always been animation and documentary mm -hmm. besides experiment. Oh, I'm sorry. You're yeah, you know, right. But, that, but this emphasis is yeah. experimental. But, yeah. you know, because the two other things just quickly is like, what, you know, they're so worried about getting butts in the seat when a big theater, yeah. one lady who's been putting... <clears throat> art in the lobby for 20 years ago why do we have to be in such a big theater it's to us and i go what are you going to put on the marquee more accessible films yeah. this year you yeah. know people already know what they're getting into they don't want to go to it you can't. really uh so important right now yeah. and, I, and a lot of people felt very helpless i have uh, um at least 10 friends okay i'll i'll even mention her name you know ernie gear his yeah. film, he makes abstract structure, right. mostly, right. you know, whatever, structuralist sort of right. film, not, I use the word abstract there, right. okay, but, you know, very um, m removed from reality. He's starting to send out emails all about change. My brother, who was super involved in ACT UP, you know, yeah. during the AIDS um, yeah. political period of the 80s, hasn't been political in t more than 10 years He's very political right. and these are all you know, a, a lot of other people's yeah. parents i know who were so, oh so involved in their yeah. children's lives and didn't care a hoot about what else was going on in the world starting to do important right. things for the world outside of their their sphere it's really it gives me that gives me some hope um yeah. that the about yeah. altruism philanthropy um just doing good for the globe. Yeah, great. And um, McLuhan talked about James Joyce's book Finnegan's Wake as we all have creative powers that we use while we're sleeping. Oh, it, oh no, never mind. I'm oh. sorry. It's still on. <laughs> yeah. We all use it. We all have these creative powers we use while we're sleeping. Mm -hmm. Artists use them while they're awake. Oh, they neat. dream awake. Yeah. Yeah. What roles? What role has dreams played in your creative process? Um, <laughs> and I've been accused of being a big time daydreamer. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. So that's okay, right? You're saying it's okay to be a daydreamer. Yay! Well, well, excellent. You want to hear the best line about that is Tim Leary taught about lucid dreaming in the skill of learning how to lucid dream, so that when you die. For six to twelve minutes, your brain keeps working, and wow. you can use the daydreaming or lucid dreaming skills and direct your path for six to twelve minutes. <laughs> Could you imagine your yeah. body's dead and your but mind's your mind is, like yeah. got six to twelve minutes to still direct this sort of path, or you know? Yeah. Um, so, anyways, no daydreaming no is good. But, daydreaming yeah. and and. Lucid dreaming, as you called it, or, or <laughs> Timothy Leary called it, um, is, and 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 that that startled jump that sometimes we get at night. Yeah. Um, sometimes, do you ever kick at night? Yeah. Any you know, kind of body. Yeah, yeah. Any kind, but sometimes that kick is yeah. is coming out of your creative impulses and um like right now i'm editing a film and i'm, I'm at this great point where i think i found the structure which is a burden for me yeah. and you know if my like the structure is never very evident and then the structure comes out so i'm like just about there with the structure so now i'm at the point where i'm um throwing in these these lucid dream or nighttime dream ideas that that um give it like a little flourish right. and it's very exciting point right. um, but the structure doesn't always come through dreaming it right. comes through like plotting right. <laughs> so I think that um, I trust dreams they they offer me a lot of answers in my life uh, you know, I'm not very disciplined about um, writing down my dreams but I speak them a lot I, you know I recount them to Whoever will listen. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it great? Because as, as creative as we are, 
and we have these amazing dreams, then when you start putting them into words, yeah. they never are as good yeah. as the dream. You right, know? right. So um, film as an art form has been swindled by capitalism. Could you comment on that line? Yeah. Um, most capitalists produced movies dull me, did, or dull and, and bore me to no extent. I'm so much not an expert on commercial film that it's almost laughable. I, like my family finds it laugh. You know, they'll say they they never would ask me about the names of movie stars because I probably won't know. And I always say that with with filmmaking, the test of uh, it, uh, about who, how you define yourself in relationship to being to the world of film is is what happens when you sit down on a bus or um, an airplane and you sit next to somebody and maybe you start a conversation and the person says, what do you do? And if you say, oh, well, I'm in film, and then they say, well, what is it? And if I say I'm a filmmaker, then it sounds like a homemaker, or you do ceramics in the basement or something, so it's not very so lofty. So what do you say? I usually say filmmaker. Oh, you I say don't filmmaker, say, yeah. right. Um, but, but I, so I don't say movie direct, film director, Dur but I do direct my own You are movies. a director, yeah, but I'm a you director. rather say filmmaker. Yeah, and because then, then people don't usually say, well, what do you think of Tom Hanks' his new movie? <laughs> you know, that, or on the other side is it, it or, or my, my nephew wants to go into the movies. So what do you suggest? <laughs> right, they are. Yeah. And you, if you go experiment, no, I always say I'm an experimental film curator, and they go, they, you know, I always think they're thinking experimental film is that like porno? Yeah. You know, they they, they don't yeah. know what experimental or film science. Is. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, it, and it's like, um, what an amazing thing because whenever you say film, there's only yeah. one train of thought. Right. Right. You know? Right. So uh, that goes to Altman's statement we're a, a, a commercial guy and i love yeah. uh, he's one right. of the rarities yeah. i love robert right. altman's films almost all of them are just a total pleasure for me we're at the he said we're at the very beginning of what film can really be we haven't come close to the medium's full potential yet everything is still so linear mm. could you comment on that yeah and he stayed pretty linear actually in some well, ways. Well, yeah, I mean... But talk it, about storytelling. I just love his work. Yeah. And his work in sound has had a major yeah. influence on me. Yeah. Major, like, a very traditional movie that he made, McCabe and Mrs. Miller. I yeah. love yeah. that film. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, the linearity of it um, has been disrupted a bit by, by more and more people who work in three-dimensional space and work with around loops and work about work around the the um, physical space of um, of the moving image. So, like, I have a little business card I make, you know, calling card, right. and I just say moving image maker. Nice. So, and someone told me that's kind of old-fashioned, but it's what I I like to say. Yeah, I like that. I always say moving image art. Yeah, so yeah. it's the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but moving doesn't have to mean moving through time, right? It can just be active. Right. So you were asking about linearity. And, yeah. And, um, well, he said it, that everything is still so linear in film. Yeah. But, you know, now that we edit digitally, it's, it's actually hard to even remember. You're editing digitally, like on Final Cut Pro, yeah. and then you get into this habit of not watching the film until, you know, from beginning to end enough. Like, I, when I used to edit on a flatbed, no matter, I had to watch it beginning to end over and over and over and over and over and over again because you'd rewind and then you were working sometimes with the original and right. all those things. And now we can just bop around. So the linearity actually isn't given the respect sometimes that it deserves. <laughs> <laughs> deserves from the old school. Yeah, right? from the yeah. old school. Yeah. So, um... You know, Michael Apted, he made Coal Miner's Daughter. I asked him once. Um, he made a documentary on a rush of rock stars. His, and this was many years ago, because along with this, Marty Scorsese, he said, I edit my films faster because of MTV, which is now oh. 25 years old. He, he actually said, I have to edit faster because of MTV. So Michael Apted 
I says, why do rock uh, video makers feel so obliged to edit so fast? Mm -hmm. And I mean, now, TV commercials, anything, everything's you edited. You mean the, the editing, the making of it, or when you watch it? No, it goes, the, 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 yes. the, the, the speed of yeah. the edits right. are so much more. Mm -hmm. we, we have so many more edits now. Why, he goes, well, because we can take in information faster. Yeah. I, I, then I thought quietly to myself, you mean, are we, are we actually learn the skill to take in information faster, or are we just brainwashed ourselves to believe we can take in information faster? And you know faster? what else? It's not just that the edits are faster. If you think about CNN now, there's three things happening right. on every... On every right. We have the, the anchor, right. then right. you have what the... the, the Right, um, scrolls. On the scrolls. scrolls yeah. And then you have the, the image of right. the, let's say, this is what's going on in Iraq, right. or this is what's right. going on in Ohio. Right. Three, and then sometimes four <laughs> things, like they might give you the time of day, right. and they might give you... Right. Oh, so, God. the question was basically, are, are, have we, are we gained a new skill to take in information faster, or are we have sort of brainwashed ourselves to believe we can take an information fast. Um, I think that people measure success by by how much you always you, you keep talking about information. So they measure success by how much information they can acquire in a short amount of time. Um, because they're never gonna have twenty five hours in a day. So the more um, content Content is it you know even yeah. that that they acquire the the more like the more hap the content they are and proud of um, when they go to bed at night. Right. Whereas I actually think that we should learn more from all the yogis around and the less is more. Yeah. Yeah. The less is the less. So we is you more. sort of think we've sort of brainwashed ourselves, or are your kids? more skilled at taking information faster. Cause no, they, they're not. They're not. Because okay. my kids are not particularly... Um, or I mean just kids in, of yeah, that kids. energy. Generation. Actually, there's a film um, I made called Window Work, yeah. um, which you'll see uh, on one of those compilations. And it's uh, I made it at the Experimental TV Center. Do you, have you ever heard? It's a, it's a funky Great. artist residency yeah. place you can go to for a few days or a few weeks in upstate New York. And um, so it's an image. I'm sitting in front of a window. Uh, it's I'm actually in the film while I'm making it. Right. And so you have this woman, and she's sort of in this. I, I should I can't explain it very much, but through the, um, there's a sort of sense of peace, and there's a sense of um, she's reading the newspaper for part of the time, and then there's all this stuff going on in the soundtrack, uh, but yet she doesn't get distracted by it, and it's a little bit. Uh, like like the the antithesis of, of what right. you're saying, like you don't allow too much clutter. You know? Right, right. <laughs> okay, we're almost the end. Okay. Um, humans tend to imitate the effects of the things that we invent. So there's hidden effects of spoken word, printed word, cell phones, toothpick, bulldozers, everything we've invented, there's hidden effects that we tend... A puny example is how... We used to hear phantom phone rings in a room and go, I think I heard the phone yeah. ring. Now, kids will keep their cell phone on vibrate in their pocket. And they, then they put the uh, cell phone on their counter and go to bed, and they feel phantom vibrations on ooh, their legs. what lives. a cool question. So, what can you that. articulate any hidden effects of film making and film viewing yeah. that humans have uh, imitated? Oh, I'll just put a new one okay. of these in. It gives me a minute to think about Um. Go ahead, you can. Yeah, I'm thinking. It'll be like uh, uh, the two hidden... more minutes. All right, I'll, I'll stay. Hey, after. Mark. <laughs> oh. The hidden effects of filmmaking would probably be um, a re restlessness that people have. Um, that they think they're in a situation and um, they 
want to change that situation so we would call that in filmmaking we'd call that an edit like I've had enough of this and I'm gonna go on to the next thing and I think that restlessness comes from media um, because prior to filmmaking and or mo moving image viewing um, uh, we lived sort of more solipsistic existence so wherever we were was where we were and we couldn't change that we, everything else maybe doesn't exist because we're right here now because of filmmaking we we I'm here but I know what's going on in other parts of the world and I actually can imagine them and I, or I know what's going on on the other side of this wall and so I I could cut to it right so we it I think there's a restlessness instead of being satisfied with where you are Lynn, sure been a pleasure. Thank, thank you, you so much. It was really now, great questions. Thank you. And now your husband. Okay. <laughs>